Hey there everyone, I'm Jeff, this is Tabletop Toolbox, and thank you for tuning in to the channel. If we haven't met before, well this is a YouTube channel dedicated to board games, card games, and other forms of tabletop gaming. I usually do crowdfunding previews on the channel, as well as a weekly segment called The Weekly Ratchet, where I talk about a variety of board gaming related topics. But this is a very special episode, and I'd like to kick off by introducing a very special guest, put it together for... Say your name. <laughs> <laughs> We're off to a great start. Off to a great start. You didn't tell me I was supposed to say my name. Yeah, well, this was like my fourth take on the opening, so we, you know, we're winging it. What's your name? Melanie. Okay, we finally got that out of the way. This is my daughter, Melanie. You are how many years old? 11. 11, and you have been playing games since? Since I was a baby. Yep, since a baby. In fact, I found this photo out on the the annals of Facebook. This is you playing a card game that I kind of put together. Uh, it, I didn't invent this, but it is a matching game. And I had a bunch of little colored circles on little post-it note or uh, uh, index cards. And I was teaching you how to match colors and play for points and play for games. And I don't expect that you remember that at all, do you? <laughs> I didn't think so. But, uh, and in fact, at the time that that picture was taken, I didn't play games either. None of the collection of games that you see behind us was, you know, in our possession at all. Uh, your mom and I didn't really start gaming until about 2016 is when we picked up Ticket to Ride, and that kind of started all of this. So, the point of this episode today is we're gonna talk about family games. This is actually in response to a question that one of our viewers asked, has, has asked a few times over on the Weekly Ratchet episode. And he asked me, his name is Simulation Chris, and he asked me to talk about not just family games, but he was looking for suggestions, ideas, on getting his kids, I believe he has a daughter, into board gaming as well. So. The first part of this show is gonna be talking about how do you get kids into gaming, and then we're gonna talk about some specific family games. So I have a question for you, and my first question is, do you remember how I got you into playing games? No. <laughs> I think that's a pretty fair answer because you know you started playing somewhere, to, somewhere around the age of, let me see, that was like I said, 16, so you were on your way to four, now, we didn't start getting you into gaming right away, but we were playing games with you even when we lived in Ohio, which is where we were living when we started uh, started doing gaming. How do I get you into games today, though? You just tell me, hey, we're gonna go play this game. Uh-huh, that is usually what I do, and your response is usually something like, do I have to? <laughs> Very accurate. Very well portrayed. It's almost like you've done that before. <laughs> I think the first answer to this question is how do you get your kids to play games with you is that you tell them to play games. You tell them the same way that you tell them to clean their room or take a shower or go get ready for bed. Uh, you know, in the long run, we are the parents, right? And sometimes we kind of have to just get our kids to try new things. I'm a firm believer that kids adapt to the environment that they live in. So just being around games all the time, seeing us playing games all the time has certainly been a catalyst as well as just saying, hey, turn off the TV or the switch or whatever and let's play a game together, right? Right. Uh, what are some other ways do you think maybe I've encouraged you to play some games? Well, I see you and mom play games a lot, so sometimes they look interesting, sometimes they don't, so that's what gets me to certain games. Yep, there have been times where, and I think this is another really good idea, is you know, sometimes, especially if you've got a spouse that you play with, or even if you have friends who maybe you get together and play games with, have a little game session over at your place and, and let the kid, let your kids walk by and just see what you're doing. Let them see the games that you're playing. It, of course, helps if you're playing something a little more adjacent to their interests. Uh, you know, if you're sitting there with a big, massive 4X strategy game or some big, heavy Vital Lacerda game, you know, that's not something that a kid's gonna see and be like, oh, I really wanna get in on this. But if you're playing something that's colorful and bright, you know, think about Wingspan, I'm thinking about Dog Park, I'm thinking about, you know, more public, more, more popular, uh, widely recognized themes, that's probably a good way to get kids in. Now, can you think of another strategy that maybe I've used in the past? Let them be on a team if you guys are playing a game. Yep, so I use this strategy a lot, and that is that, especially if I think a game might be hard for you to get into, and especially, 
if it's a difficult teach, even if it's not a hard game to play, but if you just think that there's a lot of rules that you need to cover, kids are gonna tap out on you after a few minutes, right? Like, are you still talking about how to play this game? Let's just do the things already. So a lot of times what we'll say is, you know, I'll teach her mom how to play, and then we'll say, okay, Mel, you're gonna be on mom's team, and we'll just start playing. And very, very quickly, usually, and of course, again, it's because you've grown up around games, you figure it out, you, you respond very quickly to seeing it happen in front of you. And that's how you then kind of make the shift. And there have been games where I start off and I'm just playing against your mom, and at the end I'm playing against you and losing. <laughs> <laughs> so those are a couple of things I wanted to introduce uh, as ideas to you know, get into some gaming. And the other thing, and I kind of mentioned this already, is to get games that kind of align with the interests of your kids. So. What's one of your uh, what's one of your favorite sort of hobbies or one of your favorite interests? What's something that you're really big into? I would really love to go to Japan when I'm older. Yep. And what's another? Uh, what's, I'm thinking of a particular theme that we just went up to Baltimore to go and enjoy for you. I also love sharks. She loves sharks, and so whenever I see a board game that has like that aquatic theme. Uh, Aqua Garden was one that we picked up. I've also got, I think it's called Aquatica, which isn't really sharks. There's, it's more of like a fantasy animals game. But, you know, sharks, maybe cats. We have a lot of cats. So Malem was a game I knew that I could introduce you to. Uh, we've got a couple others that we'll talk about here as we get into this list. Anything else you think that you might have to add to this topic? Anything else you want to share about gaming? Is there something about gaming that you don't like? Like what's maybe a part of gaming that you don't enjoy? I don't enjoy all the rules. Like, I prefer easy games than like harder games. Like Malem, Malem's an easy game for me, but um, like Ticket to Ride, it was harder for me to yeah, Ticket to learn Ride's, it. That's true. Ticket to Ride's a harder game, and like we were talking earlier before we started recording, Lanterns was a game that you know I didn't really think I was going to be able to teach it to. I didn't know how I was going to explain to you in that game you're kind of doing set collection i think set collection's a little tricky for kids maybe and i could be wrong you know and, and every kid's different i think that's a really important takeaway from all this uh but yeah when, it's when those games when i think they're gonna be a little harder or there's i think there's even been some where you've started teaching and i'm kind of looking at you and i'm going i know i'm not getting through <laughs> and we kind of quickly pivot and say you know what you play with mom Let's do a one on, you know, one against a team type thing. And then you usually do pick it up. And again, don't start with Voidfall, folks. Don't start with <laughs> Fatal Lacerda. Start with light games like Quaxa Quedlinburg. Malem is a great example. Uh, and we'll talk about some others. I have a massive list of games. I'm not going to get through all of them because there's just, there's a ton of them. And, and even as we've been, as I've been preparing for this video today, I went through the list of just everything that we've played out on Board Game Geek, and I just kept adding more and more and more games. So, uh, well, the other thing I do want to say real quick, it was on the top of my head, and it just flew out of my head. <laughs> and what the heck was I going to say? Oh, one other thing that I think I wanted to throw out here real quick is that, uh, you, you know, I, I, I say just get your kids to play games. Say, hey, we're going to go play a game. But you do have to know the limits, right? You can't just force your kid every day, like, we're going to play another game. No, sit down. We're going to play another game. No, uh, you know, don't go do your homework. We're going to play more games. Like, you got to be reasonable. And, and I think that folks know that. But I also have some friends who have kids and other older, kid, older kids. But... They kind of tried to get them into some games. They, they played a couple games that the kids just hated. And ever since then, they have really struggled to get any interest from them in playing games. So know, your, know the limits of your kids. Know your kids' interests. Try to ease them into it. Start with very light, simple games. Move into themes that maybe are a little bit more grown up. You know, we've started to kind of get away from the real cutesy, kidsy games. We have started getting into a little bit more grown up themes. But, you know, again, we're not doing epic 4X space battles yet. Maybe soon. Maybe soon. Anyways, next up, we're going to talk about some of our favorite family games. Now, these are not necessarily top 10 lists. Uh, we've each picked about five or so games that we're going to talk about. We'll try and show you some pictures of these games. Some of these may come off the internet, off of Board Game Geek. Uh, some of them may come from our own collection, from some videos that we've done in the past on these games. And I'm going to let you go first. Why don't you introduce one of your first favorite family games? 
So one of the games I was really into when I was younger was a game called Downforce. Yeah. Oh my God, this is heavier than I remember it being. Oh, let's, uh, there we go. So I love like racing themes. So Downforce was a really fun game for me. Downforce is, uh, this is a good game too, I think a great pick because there are a couple different ways of playing this game. There is the full-fledged game, which is racing. It is a racing game, but there is this kind of bidding and betting, you know, method to play this game. We're actually keeping track of what you've spent on the on each car. You actually have to buy your cars at the beginning of the game, and then you have to kind of bet on who you think is going to win throughout the game. And there's that whole element of it. And I think you've played that once. I think we tried that once, but there's also a family mode where you're simply playing the cars, cards, to move the cars to win the race, right? Uh, and that's one that we played a lot of times. Uh, I'll say this real quick, a fantastic game. This is from Restoration Games. A lot of different ways you can get this game. You can buy this at Target, but don't. The Target version is kind of a cheaper version of the game, a more mass-produced version of the game. There are a couple expansions of this, which I have in the box, which is why it's so heavy. There's a couple of extra tracks. And as I understand, the cars that come with the Target version don't fit well on the tracks uh, with the expansion. So I definitely recommend getting the full game, uh, which I believe you can get on Amazon and some other sources. So this is Downforce. That is a fantastic pick. I'm going to scroll down here. So my first game, well, I got a little out of order here with my stacks. Let me bring this one out first. This is Project L. Love some Project L, right? <clears throat> this is a sort of a sort of a polyomino I hate using this term, but it's like a Tetris piece. And I don't think you even know Tetris, do you? Tetris was an old video game back when I was your age, maybe even younger. Anyways, uh, in Project L, you're getting these very, very pretty, colorful, acrylic shaped pieces and you're putting them on these puzzle tiles when you fill in the tile you win you sort of complete that puzzle and you may get points you may get extra pieces to work with it's a it's a fairly simple game to teach but there's a lot of strategy to this one what do you think about project l i really like it it is a little bit thinky on how you spend your turn but I love the little tiles, they're really cute. Yes, the, this, this is one of those games that has what we call table presence. If you're sitting and playing this in like a public place, either at a game convention, uh, where have I, I, I've played this at some game events, even here in town, and you just have this pile of all these colorful pieces and people will just stop and go, well, what is this? Uh, and it has a lot of that black and white uh, as well, your 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 board and your, the tiles themselves are black and white, and so those pieces really pop off the table. And and Mel's right. So you only get three you take three actions on your turn, but this is really an efficiency puzzle. There are ways that you can do more with one of those actions, and that's kind of the, this is one of those games that we've kind of sat and said, okay, hey, I'm going to coach you through your turn, kind of help you to see that efficiency puzzle. And your scores have come up as you've played this. I don't think you've won this one yet. You may have beaten other players, but I don't think you've won this one yet. But really, really great game, Project L. All right, what else do you have, Mel? I have a small game called Q-Birds. So you're trying to get a flock of birds. So you have to gain cards in your turn, making sure or trying to get the ones that you need while also getting some extra bird, which might be useful later in the game. Is that how you always win this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is a really interesting, uh, and I'm not, I can't go super deep, deep in the details here because we'll be here forever, but it, you've got these rows of cards in the table. You're playing out cards from your hand. You have to play all of the same birds. So there's this real trade-off where, hey, I really need that card, but I got to get rid of a bunch of other cards to get it. And if you get enough cards, again, it's a set collection type game. If you get enough cards in your hand of a particular bird, then you play one or two of those birds to your table and you win the game when you either get one of each of the seven birds or two or three, three of two different birds. So it's one of each seven or three of two different birds. And both are quite difficult. Uh, and <laughs> there's also this, there's a mechanism, and you throw this a lot at, at your mom and I, 
If you get rid of all the cards in your hand, which does not mean you're out, does not mean the game is over, but if you get rid of all the cards in your hand, everybody has to get rid of all the cards in their hand. If you choose to do that action. Correct. So <laughs> that's one of those things where you're sitting there, you're crunching over this hand of birds. You're like, okay, I need to, I need to do this, I need to do that. And then Mel goes, I don't have any cards. And you're like, no, no, all my beautiful things fly away. <laughs> <laughs> that's one way to put it. Yeah, it is. We played this at uh, the Unplugged Game Cafe down in Midlothian, Virginia. And she loved it so much, I ordered it right away. A very, very fun game. It's, it's swingy, it's very lucky, but it's a very cute game. Q birds. Let me see, the next one I've got here, I'm gonna skip down to this one. So this is a series of games. This is Trekking the World. The first one was Trekking the National Parks, and there is a new one called Trekking Through Time, which I don't care for at all. I don't like that <laughs> game at all. It uses a, a uh, sort of a ratchety Rondell system that I just don't like uh, very much at all. But Trekking the World is one of those where, again, I think you have a couple different actions that you can take on your turn. You can fly to different uh, airports. Uh, you can try to see certain sites. You're collecting cards or just drawing cards to let you move around. You're trying to collect very diff uh, different artifacts from different places. It's been a little while since we played this, but it is a it's a beautiful game, and it also has some really great educational value to it because on each card where you're trying to go. You can actually, I believe you can flip it over and it will talk to you about the landmarks, whether it's you know a, a famous park in Australia or a famous monument in, you know, even in America, whatever. There's all kinds of really neat places and it'll tell you about them. It'll give you a write-up uh, to let you know, you know, some facts about that place. And the art's really good. It's a really good game. We should probably should break this one out and play it again. We should. What do you think about Trek in the World? I think it, it's a super fun game, in my opinion, but I don't remember much about it, so I don't have much to say about it. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. We'll let her have that one. Trekking the world. All right, what have you got next? Next, I have a game called Ticket to Ride. This was one of the first games I played. Yep, this is an expansion of Ticket to Ride. Let me just mention that for the viewers. Uh, this is the Ticket to Ride Japan. Mel mentioned that she's a huge fan of Japanese culture and, and history and such. So the base game, you know, we, obviously you have to have the base game to play the expansion. There are a ton of Ticket to Ride expansions. There's also a Ticket to Ride Legacy game, which we have been working through. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm yapping. Why don't you tell us some more about Ticket to Ride? So Ticket to Ride is a place tokens out type game where you are trying to get like railroad tracks all around a certain place. And you are also completing different tickets where you have to connect to certain cities in order to get the ticket and get the points. Yep, that, yeah, a route building, path building game with uh, what we kind of call contract completion. You're exactly right, but you're trying to complete certain routes. <clears throat> and you start off with a couple of these you have to go, uh, work towards. You can get more that you're trying to work towards. And uh, if you don't complete them, you lose points at the end of the game. The Japan one was different because it added bullet trains. And it was kind of, if I remember, it was even a separate track that you were trying to build. And I don't even remember exactly how it worked, but it was a different you know, mechanism. Now, the Legacy game has a lot going on in it. We're not going to spoil any of it here. If you don't know, Legacy games are games where the game evolves every time you play it. So I think there's only 12 games in the Legacy version of Ticket to Ride. I think we're on like seven or eight. I think we're at like eight, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think it might be eight. And by now, there's a ton of stuff that we have to do on our turns. I have found it to be too what we call fiddly. It's just, there's, I feel like there's too much that we have to do on each one of our turns. But I know you've been having a lot of fun with it. You won the last game, fair and square, with a ton of money. Uh, and so we do need to get back and get that game finished. And the nice thing with the Legacy game is that you can keep playing it even after you have finished the main story. And you will have a copy of Ticket to Ride Legacy that no one else has. Yours will be unique in some form or fashion from anyone else's copy of the game. So that's Ticket to Ride. Anything else you want to add about this one? No. Okay, well, thanks for all the wording. <laughs> that's very helpful. <laughs> okay, let me get down to another one for me. 
Uh, I'm gonna jump down to this one. This was one of our first games that we played. This is Planet. This is by Blue Orange Games. I mean, try and pick, there we go. Uh, this is, I think this is a very, very unique game. And this is honestly one of my favorite gateway or welcoming games. This is a fantastic game. Uh, if you're gonna hang out with say grandparents or folks who don't play games, especially these modern hobby games, this is a great title, very, very easy to teach. Very, very easy to just sit down and say, okay, we know what, we're just gonna play this and I'll show you how it works while we're getting into it. Works really, really well with this. You are actually putting magnetic tiles on a dodecahedron, like a, like a large sized die. And each one of the sides is 12 sides, each side is magnetic, and you're snapping on these terrain tiles. You've got forests and mountains and ice and tundra and ocean. And then throughout the game, you've got this display of animal cards on the table, and you're trying to attract animals to your planet by building the biomes, the environments that they want. And whoever has the most abundant or largest or most varied number of biomes will attract that animal each round. And that's basically how you score the points at the end of the game. This one, uh, yeah, I, I love this one. This one makes a very, very pretty, end game when you have these really colorful planets you can say oh look at my planet this thing's so neat uh, i love this one do you remember this one very well what are your thoughts on planet i mean i just love the art the art is like really interesting and sometimes i wish the earths that we create were real <laughs> like i love water so i would probably make like a mostly water planet and if that was like the planet, I would be in heaven. <laughs> yeah, that's one where you can get, uh, you know, you may be trying to get whales or sharks to come and live on your planet. And so if you have the largest oceans or the most number of oceans, that might be how you get those, uh, those animals. What else have you got to show us? Well, I have a game that I think is very cute. It's called <laughs> Fossilus. Yep, Fossilus is from Kids Table Board Games. They make a bunch of games that are in that kind of family weight category. So these are games that have uh, very approachable themes, obviously dinosaurs, they've got some about food. They actually have one about diving for treasure in the ocean we haven't uh, tried out yet. Uh, and they've got a couple about uh, you know animals living in the forest. What can you tell us about Fossilus? Well, Fossilus is like a digging game. So you can like move tiles on the board to uncover buried treasure and then you can take certain actions to pull out certain dinosaur bones which then you use to like recreate dinosaurs yep yep you've got these dinosaur cards you're trying to dig for the various bones that they need there's actually little tweezers you use to pluck the bones out and there's a bunch of other little systems going along with this there are some uh like tool cards you can collect that kind of give you some extra abilities you actually have to use plaster to get the bones out of the ground just like a real uh what uh, archaeologist and a paleontologist. paleontologist thank you that's the right word see <laughs> stay in school kids stay in school and uh yeah that's what you're trying to do with this and, and it is it's a very colorful game i've always kind of felt like it sometimes i felt like it ended a little too quick or I just couldn't get enough done with the plaster. But there's, and again, it's one of those kind of efficiency puzzle games where you, if you just waste a bunch of actions to get plaster, you'll never get anything done. You've got to use those other cards, those other abilities that you have to get things done. Uh, I'll say also real quick, there, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of kids' table board games titles out there. Uh, they have one called Creature Comforts, which we had and it was a very, very pretty game, but it was absurdly long to play, and so we did get rid of that one. Not all their games, I would say, are hits, but Fossilus is definitely a very good title, and, and their, their production is fantastic. Their games look amazing. Uh, definitely something that I can't uh, deny about kids' table board games. Good pick. So the next one I'm gonna mention, and I'm gonna talk some more about these types of games in a moment, but this is a relatively new title called Robot. Quest Arena, I'm getting a lot of glare in that box. Let's try and do that, there we go. This is a robot fighting game. It's what we call a deck builder, right? So in deck builders, you start with, a, everyone starts with a very, uh, an identical deck of cards, and then throughout the game, you're buying more cards, maybe getting rid of the original cards and trying to build a more powerful deck. Those cards in this game let you move these robots around and then just wail on each other with hammers and guns and flamethrowers and all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is a very, we call this a take that game. 
where you can attack each other. You are just outright hurting each other. But what's really nice with this one is that when you are taken out, you don't lose anything, and on your next turn, you get right back into the fight. So you just kind of get temporarily offset from the board, and then you come right back on. What can you tell us about Robot Quest Arena? I really like the little characters that are the robots. There's a little pug. There's like a bunch of different like types of characters, types of robots. And they're so cute. <laughs> but sometimes I feel bad for taking out cute robots, like the pug. Yep, yeah, the, the pieces are adorable. They're full color, so everything comes uh, basically as you see it. And uh, this is just a great game. It, it gets people kind of laughing. Uh, and I think this is a really great way to, th this is a good entry in that kind of take that, let's say fighting games, because of the fact that you don't really lose anything when you get taken out. And a lot of times kids, you know, can certainly get, you know, feelings kind of hurt. They can get a little flustered when, when especially if grownups are taking things from them and they feel like they're losing or they're getting hurt, uh, that'll just really take them out of a game, you know? And let's face it, we were like that when we were kids. But this is a great way to get them to kind of understand like, hey, yeah, you're getting smacked around, it's fine. On your turn, you get right back in there and you just keep hammering, uh, you know, your parents or whatever. And, and it's a lot of fun. And you just hit him with a heavy hammer. <laughs> hit him with a hammer, yep, she loves doing that. What else do you have over there, daughter? Well, I have this cute game, ugh, it's heavy. It's called Flamecraft. Flame Craft. This one is from Lucky Duck Games and Cardboard Alchemy. Uh, the, there's a real neat story to this, real quick. It was that the artist makes dinosaurs and she just did a lot of dinosaur art. And the designers of the game saw her art and thought, we need to make a game around this. And they made Flame Craft. And it is probably one of the prettiest games in our collection. What can you tell us about Flame Craft? So Flamecraft is like you're tr you're building a shop area. You're building a little like, a market. A yeah, town. like yep. a little market. Yep. And it's I love the art, the little tokens of like potions and meat and leaves. It's all so cute. And the dragons are super adorable. So this is a worker placement game. You have one worker, it's a dragon, and you're placing the dragon on these different shops. You're collecting the various ingredients and then using those ingredients to complete recipes, whether it's for food or if you're trying to build... Like a you know, potion. Yeah, potions or even like, uh, I don't want to say weapons, but there's like a blacksmith. And so you might be building a wine goblet or, you know, some piece of silverware or something like that. So you're kind of crafting things and you're moving uh, dragon cards around from shop to shop you're kind of trying to get the right dragons at the right shops so that the shops can be more productive and it's just a lot of there's a lot of moving pieces in the game but it's not a heavy game at all it's not a hard game to play uh, and you're all just doing this to get points and this is another one of those games uh, the reason I really like this for families is that I think it helps teach kids and it's even helped to teach me to be quick thinking uh, it's a strategic game, but there is a tactical element to it in that if Mel puts out a card that might finish a shop, and if the shop has all three dragons in it, then a new shop comes out into town. That new shop may have some really powerful ability, even if like maybe you're the first person to get there. And you may realize, well, hey, geez, I was going to do this, but if I go to that new shop, I can get a lot more points. And you have to be a little quick thinking. You have to be dynamic and not just stay rigid to a plan. And I think that's a good, uh, you know, a good idea to teach kids is how to sort of be able to, you know, maybe change your ideas, maybe jump into a different strategy real quick. Be, again, quick thinking, a little dynamic thinking. And I think Flamecraft is really great for this. Beautiful game. I believe you can buy this at Barnes & Noble. It may not have quite all the deluxe pieces that we have in this copy, but a, a beautiful game nonetheless, Flamecraft. And one thing I really love about the dragon cards is that their name matches with their symbol. Like, I don't know what the one's name, but there's- Yeah, we'll flash, a, a, we'll flash a couple up on the screen and let people yeah. see them. But yeah, some of them are really adorably named uh, and they all kind of go along with their theme. Yep, that's a great, uh, a great thing to point out. All right, so I've got just one more game here to mention. And this is a game that gets, a, this one gets a lot of static in the in the hobby. And I, 
I'm not even entirely sure why, but this is upside down and it <laughs> is Exploding Kittens. Now, this is a card game. You can buy this absolutely everywhere. You can get it at Walmart. You can buy this thing everywhere. Uh, and it is a silly card game where you are basically just trying to be the last player standing. It has what we typically avoid in card games and board games, which is what we call player elimination. And that is that if you blow up because an ex a kitten exploded you, which let's face it, kittens would do it, <laughs> right? Like our kitten. Yeah, our kitten, <laughs> holy moly. Uh, if a kitten explodes you, you're basically out of the game. Now there is another version of this called zombie kittens, which I had avoided getting because I was afraid it was gonna be gross. And it's maybe a little gross. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. But it does give you a way to keep playing even after you have been exploded. Uh, and we haven't gotten to play with that one too much. We tried it out once. But a lot like Robot Quest Arena, I think this is a great game because it gives kids a chance to play at an aggression level with their parents. So again, it lets a kid try to blow up their mom or dad. Uh, you've got the nope cards that let you, you know, stop what someone is doing, even if it wasn't gonna hurt you anyways. And there's just a lot of like, sort of being a little snarky, being a little jerky, but you can all sit and laugh about it. And I'll tell you, Mel has clicked with this <laughs> game so well. She gets so vicious with this game. It's adorable except for when I'm on the receiving end of it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I tell you, uh, you know, my, uh, if I think about my game, gaming group, or even if I think about your mom, I really wouldn't want to play this game because it can be mean. But for the three of us, we have had so much fun with it. We take it to pubs, you know, when we go and meet up with other friends and you can get, you know, milk and jump right in this game with other grownups. You have blown other adults out of the water with this game. Uh, and so I really recommend Exploding Kittens and any of its variants. They're all a lot of fun. The Streaking Kittens card is, I think, still my favorite. And in fact, we did a review of this over on the Dice Tower. You can certainly check that out. We even did our top 10 favorite cards in Exploding Kittens, and people really did love that review. So go check that out if you're interested. You've got one more to share. Why don't you share this last game? So this game is probably by far my favorite game of all. <laughs> this is a brand new one too. We just got this mm -hmm. one. Ugh, it's heavy. Let's go to Japan. This is from Josh Wood, the designer, uh, and it's published by AEG Games. What can you tell us a little bit about Let's Go to Japan? So Let's Go to Japan is about planning a trip in Japan, what you're gonna do throughout the week. So you can go to two different cities, Tokyo and Kyoto, and each day, depending on like the random order of the chips, you want to try and match that symbol for that day. So let's back up just one second so people can understand. Yeah, each day you kind of set a common, uh, a desired goal or a desired theme that you want to do that day. So you might be going to go get some good food. You might be looking to do some shopping. You might be going, going to check out statues and pagodas. You may be looking to just meet people. And there's a couple others, right? Yeah, so like ran talking and looking at flowers. Yeah, exactly. Yep, looking for, uh, for gardens and such. And so you lay these tokens out for each day and then everyone matches them to be the same way. So you're all kind of trying to do the same things in the same day. And like Mel was saying, you're then trying to play cards to that day that will give you those symbols to, to work towards that objective. And then what do you do after you got all your cards out? So once you have all your cards out, so during the game you'll earn um, like certain tokens or abilities and you get train tickets that allow you to go to different cities. So if you were starting in Tokyo, but then you're like, oh, this is in Kyoto, I'm still gonna put it there. You have to put a ticket to travel between the two cities. Yep, and so after you've laid out all your days and you've laid out all those cards, then you actually take your trip to Japan. And there's an element of the rules where it says that, you know, maybe for your first game, you all take your, uh, you know, do it individually. But then once you get good at the game, it recommends you can just all do this at the same time. And we've never done that because I think that it's a lot more fun 
for each of you one at a time to talk about the trip that you're going on in Japan. There's a ton of cards in the game and each one's got different shops, different restaurants. There's even a board game store uh, card in here, which was just delightful. And so we're always, you know, every time we play this, we tell the story. Well, first I'm gonna go to see this statue and you're moving up the, the little tokens to track how much you've seen the various symbols. Each day there's a goal that you're trying to get at the end of the day. I mean, if you've met that objective, up to that point in your week, you may score some extra points. And so again, we tell it like a story. And we've even played this up to five players, which is the maximum player count with some friends. And we kind of realized that we were actually doing some of the same things on the same day at the same time, like the first card, second card, or third card. And then we were joking like, oh, well, you and I went to that place together, but I guess I was doing too much shopping. That's why you left me here, <laughs> you know, and just telling some funny stories like that, which was, it made for a longer game, but it was a lot of fun. We were all sitting there laughing and having a great time. Uh, another game where the production quality is just fantastic. This should be coming out to retail. It's AEG, so it will come out to retail. Uh, again, you may not be able to get all the fancy deluxe components, but you'll definitely have all the cards. You'll have that gameplay. And, and I, I agree, it's been a fantastic experience for our family. Anything else you wanna say about Let's Go to Japan? Well, there is one card that fits well for us because my dad is great at making ramen, in my opinion. <laughs> and there's one card that says, go get ramen at the best place. Yep. So I love that card because I love your Robin. <laughs> so it just works for us. Yep, yeah, that's just it. I think we have all found something in this game. With me, it's the board game store. You, it's the ramen store, ramen restaurant. We've, we've all found something we love on that one. Yep, that's a great choice. So I got just a couple other games I wanna run through. And again, I'm not gonna go through a huge list. I mean, we have played a ton of different games. Uh, and in fact, I know that one game that's not on this list is Core Quest. Core Quest is a dungeon crawling game that was actually designed by a young girl named Cora and her dad, Dan Hughes. Cora is Mel's age like within a month or two. They're really, really close in age. And we had a lot of fun with that. Now it's a little bit more of a random, sort of a dice rolling game, but very, very adorable art. The art is actually from children that then they had a designer kind of touch up and color, but all the art is authentic to these kids' designs. And it's a really cute game. You can get it in a bunch of different places. Um, couple common sort of themes I wanna talk about. So for us, any dexterity game is, is a hit. And I do have one here. This is again, one of our earliest games. This is Pitch Car Mini. Pitch Car is another racing game, but it's pure skill. Like there's no rolling dice. There's no drawing cards and just, oh, I, I go slow this time. No, you're flicking these little tokens across these wooden tracks and you know just trying to take all these different maneuvers. Uh, I went with the mini version because at the time you were four years old and I wanted something that could kind of work with her tiny hands. There's a larger version of the game, which I think is all that you can get. The pitch car mini is very, very difficult to get. I have a lot of money in the, the pitch car mini stuff, but pitch car is a, uh, a really good game. I've also got ice cool on this list, uh, a little game about getting penguins around a school. Uh, and then also we have Clask. Clask is kind of a twist between what is it? It's like air hockey. It's like soccer. And soccer, like... crokinole, like it's all kinds of stuff. It's got little magnets. It's a crazy, silly, chaotic game with a very small play surface. Uh, I highly recommend Clask. And it's a two player game, but you can get a four player version, which we've just never bothered with. Uh, I've already talked a bit about fighting games like Exploding Kittens and Robot Quest Arena. I also have Lorcana on this list. This is a new collectible card game, which is by Ravensburger, but it's entirely Disney themed. Do you want to talk about Lorcana for a quick moment? Sure. What can you tell us about Lorcana? So Lorcana is like, you're trying to take out different people's cards to get rid of their ability to get lore, which yeah, is the way you win the game. Yeah, I was gonna say, what you're trying to do is quest to get lore. But if you see that a player is getting some really powerful cards out, then you can challenge those cards to kind of weaken their ability. It's a little odd, if I may, in that sometimes you might have Winnie the Pooh trying to fight the genie, which is a little weird. But the art in this game is just 
phenomenal. All of the art is new commissioned art for the game. It's all of your classic characters, Winnie the Pooh, you've Olaf. got... Olaf. Yeah, Olaf. You've got all the Frozen characters, Mulan characters, uh, Atlantis. I, I didn't even know there was a movie about Atlantis until I saw the cards in Lorcana, and then we watched the movie on Disney+. Plus. And I love the Atlantis movie. Yep. And I love the main character, Milo Thatch. Which we have a couple of his cards now, yep. So this is, a, you know, it's a simple game. Uh, in fact, we've been playing the higher score counts because I wanted to experience a little bit more of the game. And we've got like some of the mats for it. I built some custom lore counters that we can use. This is a good game. You know, we go to a, a brewery here in town. My wife and I will go there frequently. And of course, Mel comes along. They have a arcade that you can play some games. And we'll sit there and we'll play Lorcana. And, you know, and a lot of people will come, oh, what is this? You know, because they think it's Magic the Gathering or something like that. And you tell them, oh, no, it's a Disney version of that kind of idea. And they're always really surprised. So, uh, yeah, Lorcana is a good game. And, again, it's a fighting game. It's a game where, you know, your, your kids can kind of play at that equal level to the parents without repercussions of beating up mom and dad, right? So a good game there. And then lastly, I've got a couple polyomino style games. We already talked about Project L. Uh, we also have number nine, which is a very, very simple game, albeit with a little bit of a challenging math twist to it, but a really good game. And, and I'll spell it on the screen here because it's a unique spelling of the game. And then there's also Baron Park. I think you've played Baron Park one or twice, once or twice. And that's where you're kind of trying to build almost like a an animal sanctuary kind of a thing of different bears and koalas and such like that. Like little like arcade areas for like the kids. Yep, yeah, you can build some little shops and things like that. Basically all you're just trying to do is you're trying to cover the board with various shapes uh, of different enclosures to hold polar bears and and black bears and whatever else. But yeah, a very, very cute game. And, uh, and that's uh what you got? <laughs> oh no! Oh, we were doing so good. It's gonna be it's gonna be a train wreck. We might want to wrap this up before boogers. <laughs> okay, we're good. Are there I any thought. other games that you want to recommend, real quick? Anything else you want to throw out there? Nope, we hit the list. I think we hit the list. Okay. <laughs> well, hey, there are a ton of great family games out there. There's just a fantastic wealth of information that you can find on websites like Board Game Geek. Certainly feel free to post any questions in the comments of this video and I will certainly answer them. We'll even see if uh, Mel can weigh in on any questions that you might have as well. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for checking out Tabletop Toolbox. We're glad that you're here and we will see you soon on the next episode of the Weekly Ratchet. Talk to you later, folks. Cheers. <laughs>